All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, in this lecture, what we're going to do is look at the relationship between uh, the behavior of movement of chromosomes and uh, the passage of traits uh, from parent to offspring. Now, uh, we know that uh, the traits we see in an organism, uh, you know, when looking at a person, uh, you know, the color of their skin, color of their eyes, color of their hair, uh, the height of the individual is all due to uh, the production of proteins that uh, build and then operate the body. Now, uh, we know through the central dogma that genes are the uh, instructions uh, for making proteins. So, you know, thinking of the central dogma, we ultimately take this information, oops, and uh, use it to make uh, the proteins that build and operate our body. Now, uh, genes have a, a physical location and uh, that location is on uh, the chromosomes. So uh, by observing the movement uh, or tracking the movement of chromosomes uh, during uh, meiosis, uh, you are able to uh, elucidate or see how genes, uh, in essence, get passed on from parent to offspring uh, following those patterns uh, first observed by Mendel. Now, this is a nice diagram that goes into um, images related to uh, meiosis. So, you know, here we have, you know, production of a new organism and then voila, these uh, individual cells are going to be undergoing uh, meiosis. Now, Mendel's law of independent assortment is illustrated by the relative uh, positions or arrangements of these uh, homologous chromosomes. You know, if you have a particular uh, set of chromosomes from one parent, uh, they can both be lined up on the same side of the metaphase plate or they can be on opposite sides of the metaphase plate. How one set of homologous chromosomes pairs up has no impact on how a different uh, pair of homologous chromosomes uh, arrange because again, there are different spindle fibers uh, attaching to the different uh, homologs. Now, uh, the law of segregation is illustrated by the events of anaphase one. Uh, to segregate means to separate so here we have these homologous chromosomes, one from one biological parent, one from the other. During anaphase one, as the microtubules uh, shorten, as the uh, motor proteins walk the uh, uh, chromosomes down the microtubules, uh, you physically separate homologous chromosomes so that ultimately uh, what gets passed on in the gametes is only one copy uh, of the uh, original pair. So in the diploid organism, uh, you have two copies, one from each parent, but then again, in the offspring, only one pair uh, is passed. So again, by tracking the movement of these chromosomes, uh, we are able to uh, confirm uh, Mendel's laws of independent assortment and segregation. Now, uh, much of the early work on chromosome behavior was done uh, in the lab of Thomas Hunt Morgan, and he did his work uh, using fruit flies uh, as a model. Fruit flies were chosen uh, because of their quick generation time. Uh, you know, they can uh, have a new uh, generation created within about two weeks. Uh, they produce a prodigious number of offspring and uh, they only have uh, four chromosomes to track rather than you know, the 46 that we see uh, in humans. Now, there are a couple of important terms here uh, that you'll want to review. Uh, the first being uh, wild type. Now, rather than saying dominant or recessive, uh, the lab that uh, Morgan was in looked at whether or not a trait was typically seen in nature or uh, in this instance, rarely seen in nature. Now the trait typically seen in nature is referred to as being wild types. Just think of what would you see out in the wild. Uh, now, in the instance of these fruit flies, the wild type uh, characteristic is red eyes. So there's a protein produced that gives the eyes these red color. Oftentimes in nature, a mutant form of a gene will lead to a non-functioning gene and ultimately no protein being produced. So in this instance, instance the white eyes are the result of a mutation that prevents the production of the red pigment. So uh, again, to review, wild type produces the protein. We oftentimes refer to this as being uh, dominant. The mutant uh, type produces no protein. Uh, we often think of this as being uh, the recessive form. Now, the nomenclature they use, or the, the symbols they used, uh, they use the first letter of the mutant uh, allele, so they chose W. And to indicate that uh, for this particular W gene, as the, they refer to it, uh, the wild type produces the protein, uh, so they give a, a, a positive sign or a plus sign there to indicate uh, the wild type gene.
Now, um, looking at the uh, experiment conducted by Morgan, he originally took uh, two homozygous, uh, I'm sorry, a, a red-eyed female homozygous for the wild type gene and crossed uh, those females with wide-eyed males, so they're uh, mutant uh, for that particular gene. Now obviously, if the parent is homozygous wild type and the other parent is homozygous mutant, all the offspring are going to be heterozygous. So uh, heterozygous offspring in this instance uh, had the wild type characteristic, they were all red-eyed, but what uh, they did was allow males and females from this F1 generation to do was uh, breed with one another. As a result of that, the F2 generation had red and wide-eyed organisms, but what was unexpected was the fact that females only had red eyes, and males, approximately half of them had red eyes and approximately half had white. So while the uh, genes were passed on from parent to offspring, the uh, passage of those genes was uh, somewhat unexpected. Now, uh, Morgan uh, worked through this uh, conundrum here and proposed that what must have occurred is that this particular gene for eye color is found on the X chromosome. Uh, that's significant because males and females have a different number of X chromosomes. Since females have two X chromosomes, uh, they'll be affected at a different rate uh, than males in relation to uh, the reception of uh, this gene for red eyes. Now at this time, I'd like to fold in uh, the term hemizygous, hemi meaning half. Uh, males are referred to as being hemizygous for sex chromosomes uh, since they only have one uh, X. Now, uh, this is a nice uh, image of um, what uh, occurred in the lab uh, experiments done with uh, fruit flies in relation to uh, this eye color. Now, if we look at the example here, um, Mom is, again, homozygous for wild type, so she has two of the W plus alleles. And Dad is mutant for that allele, so he has the W with no superscript there. And again, since it's on the X chromosome, Dad only has one copy. So in effect, uh, the phenotype of the father is white-eyed and the phenotype of the mother is red-eyed. Now, when they mated, uh, Mom, being homozygous, always passed on the wild type allele to her offspring. And Dad, being mutant for that gene, uh, passed on the X chromosome with the mutant allele to his daughter, but to his son he passed the Y chromosome, so it's unaffected. So the offspring uh, of this mating uh, then um, were able to mate with one another in the F2 generation. Now, in this F1 they all have red eyes, right, because each of them has uh, a wild type allele that they inherited from their mother. So the father in the F2 generation then, he can pass on his wild type allele in the X chromosome to all of his daughters. Two sons will pass the X chromosome, so that's inconsequential for this particular trait. The mother being heterozygous uh, to half of her offspring, uh, you would expect her to pass on uh, the wild type allele, uh, but to half of her offspring, she would also pass on the mutant allele. Now, this doesn't really impact the phenotype of the daughters because all daughters are going to get a wild type allele from their dad. But uh, since the males are hemizygous, um, the uh, mutant allele from the mother would be expressed uh, in the male, even though it's only one copy. So that sort of fits the uh, pattern of inheritance seen by Morgan. Um, all the females were red-eyed and half the males were red-eyed and half were white-eyed and bushy-tailed. All right, the, there certainly is a chromosomal basis uh, for the inheritance of sex. Uh, females are, um, have a double set of X chromosomes, or uh, have a set of X chromosomes, uh, which are larger and contain a number of uh, more genes. Males have one X chromosome, the chromosome required for life, and then a dinky little Y chromosome uh, as well. Now, what's important to uh, recognize is the fact that these are non-homologous chromosomes, despite the fact that the Y chromosome has uh, portions of it on the ends or telomeres here that are homologous with portions of the Y chromosome. Uh, in you know, any respect that we're going to be looking at, they are non-homologous chromosomes. Now, uh, what we'll do shortly is then look at uh, the impact of having uh, these non-homologous chromosomes between males and females.